All right, moving on with our endocrine system or, uh, lectures, we're moving on to our adrenal glands. So the adrenal glands, we have two adrenal glands. Uh, they are located on top of each of the kidneys. So one over the right and one over the left kidney. And the adrenal glands are going to release three different classes of hormones. They are the mineral corticoids, and the main mineral corticoid uh, hormone in humans is called aldosterone. Uh, glucocorticoids, not corticoids, glucocorticoids. Uh, the main one in humans is cortisol. And then also androgens, which are uh, sex hormones, are very weak sex hormones. Um, the levels are very, very low uh, that are produced here in the uh, adrenal glands. And they include estrogen and also testosterone. Now, if we look at the adrenal glands, we notice that it is separated into two separate parts. There's the outer portion that's called the cortex and then the inner portion, which is called the medulla. And we're going to see that the um, cortex is going to be responsible for producing those mineral corticoids, glucocorticoids, and androgens. And there's going to be a, another type of hormone slash neurotransmitter that is produced in the adrena medulla, and that's in a class called catecholamines, and it includes epinephrine and norepinephrine. So different sections, different hormones produced. So we're gonna work our way outward in. So if we were to look at the adrenal cortex under a microscope, um, again, the adrenal cortex is the outermost layer, you would see that histologically the cells look differently. And I'm sure you're looking at this right now and thinking to yourself, uh, no, they don't look different to me. They all just look like pink little spots. But I promise you, if you were very learned on a microscope and you spend a lot of time looking at histology slides, uh, you would be able to perceive a difference. Um, the three zones or the three different layers of cells that we find in the adrenal cortex are going to be the outermost layer called the zona glomerulosa. And it's called the zona glomerulosa because the cells in there are kind of globular or round. In the middle, we have the zona fasciculata. Uh, this is probably the largest portion. And the zona fasciculata is going to produce those glucocorticoids. And I don't know if I said it, but the zona glomerulosa, um, as well as being the outermost layer, is going to be responsible for producing the mineral corticoids, or in humans, that's aldosterone. The zona fasciculata is the middle layer. It's going to produce the glucocorticoids, and in humans, that's going to be cortisol. And then there's a thin layer um, of reticulate, or kind of like linear, um, cells called the zona reticulata and this is going to be the innermost layer of the cortex that's going to butt right up against the medulla and this is where we're going to have the androgens produced the estrogen and the testosterone so let's talk about these from again and uh, these zones or these hormones from the outside in so the outermost layer is called the zona glomerulosa it is going to produce mineral corticoids and in humans that main one there is going to be aldosterone so aldosterone has a role in helping um, regulate blood pressure Again, this regulation of blood pressure is going to be through uh, controlling the volume of blood. And we've seen this before with the antidiuretic hormone, and you're gonna see it again when we talk about the uh, circulatory system. When you increase your water, you know, water reabsorption or your water retention, thereby decreasing the urine output. So if you increase the amount of water that your body keeps, that water is going to inevitably, you know, end up, or some of it is going to end up in the blood, and the blood is going to increase its volume. 
And if the volume of the blood increases, then the pressure inside the blood is going to increase. Uh, just think of, I, I used the fire hose analogy, but think of a water balloon. If you have a water balloon and you have a little bit of water in it, there's not much pressure on the balloon itself. But if you fill that water balloon up with a lot of water, if we increase the volume, then that balloon is going to be um, under very high pressure. So more volume, more pressure. Less volume, less pressure. And I just realized that you guys can see over my corner, if you're wondering what this is, this is, um, I have a pet squirrel and she is in um, the dining room with me today. So please excuse her um, jumping about. Okay. So aldosterone is going to play a part in this um, control of blood pressure because aldosterone, when it's released, is a hormone that's going to target your kidneys. Your kidneys is going to are there to filter your blood. Um, and when aldosterone hits the, uh, you know, attaches to the target cells or acts on the target cells in the kidneys, it's going to allow the kidneys to increase reabsorption of sodium increase the excretion of potassium, so it's gonna get rid of potassium, it's gonna put that potassium in the urine, and it's going to increase water retention. Um, a basic rule is, is wherever sodium goes, water is gonna follow. So if you've ever, you know, eaten a really salty snack, and you're like, oh, you wake up the next morning, you're like, oh, I'm so dehydrated, um, you know, I need some more water, why? Because that salt, um, sends messages that you need to increase your water intake, okay? The effect of aldosterone, as I said, is going to be a control of blood pressure. In fact, the effect is gonna be a long-term regulation of blood pressure. So if, again, the rule goes, is we increase water retention, we can increase our blood volume, and if we increase our blood volume, we're going to increase our blood pressure. That is one thing. Um, that you are going to get so tired of hearing this semester because we're going to hear it say it again and again and again just in various um, lectures and various systems that we talk about. So some triggers for the release of aldosterone uh, is going to be a protein that is actually produced in the liver called angiotensin. So um, there is a pathway that we're going to talk about when we talk about blood pressure control. It's called the angiotensin aldosterone, uh, angiotensin renin aldosterone um, mechanism. And in this case, what happens is that when low blood pressure is detected, your liver produces angiotensin. And that angiotensin, that protein, is going to um, calls for the production of renin. Um, and renin then is going to trigger the release of aldosterone. And aldosterone then is going to cause water retention, which is going to increase your blood volume, which is then going to raise your blood pressure, thereby bringing that low blood pressure back up to its normal homeostatic state. Angiotensin is going to be the strongest stimuli for the release of aldosterone. Um, other things that are going to be stimuli are high extracellular potassium levels. So that is going to um, be a trigger for aldosterone because it's going to cause the kidneys to get rid of or excrete that potassium. So if there's too much potassium in the blood, it's going to say, all right, dump this potassium. Uh, kidneys filter that potassium out and get, uh, put it out in the urine. Low extracellular sodium levels, again, it is aldosterone is going to trigger the kidneys to reabsorb sodium. So if, if we have low extracellular sodium levels, aldosterone is going to cause the kidneys to reclaim as much sodium as possible and leave that out of the urine formation. And then again, low fluid and blood volume is going to trigger the aldosterone. If you have low fluid or low blood volume, you naturally are going to have a lower blood pressure. Uh, so that lower blood pressure is going to bring about um, this chain of events that is going to result in, uh, again, the kidneys retaining more water, increasing blood volume, and then also increasing blood pressure. All right, moving on to the 
middle portion of the adrenal cortex, we have the zona fasciculata. The zona fasciculata is going to be responsible for producing a group of a classification, shall we say, of hormones called the glucocorticoids. And in humans, the main one of this is going to be cortisol. So cortisol, you may have heard before because cortisol is often ref um, referred to as the stress hormone. When we are under prolonged stress, um, emotional stress, um, physical stress, uh, you know, stress that my stupid bird will not shut up. Okay, she just said it. <laughs> Any kind of stress um, that is longer than, you know, immediate, and I mean immediate, like, oh crap, I just, you know, you know, passed a cop doing 90 miles an hour. That's like your immediate stress. Um, anything that is prolonged, you know, we're talking about, oh, am I gonna be able to get all my work done this semester? That's prolonged stress. Um, is going to cause the release of cortisol. And what cortisol is going to do, it is going to help um, provide your body with what it needs to power through a stressful situation. So the target organs um, and the effect. So the first thing cortisol is going to affect is gonna be your liver. So in your liver, uh, you store glycogen, and you may remember glycogen from um, Bio 103. Glycogen is one of those biological molecules that is made um, where in animals, where uh, a glucose is bonded to a glucose, bonded to a glucose, bonded to a glucose, is essentially a way of animals storing a very quick um, reserve of glucose when needed. And so cortisol is going to stimulate the liver to undergo what is called glucogenesis, or the um, genesis means the um, forming of the new formation, and gluco means the glucose, so it's the formation of new glucose. And the way it's going to do this is it's going to take those glycogen molecules that are made up of those long strands of individual glucose is bonded together, and it's going to start cutting those bonds off so that little, um, the little portions of glucose are going to be released and moved into the bloodstream. Why would we want glucose levels to go up in our blood if we were under stress? Well, that glucose is going to provide extra energy to all of our cells um, so that they can um, function and uh, you know, undergo uh, uh, cellular respiration. And it's going to provide us with energy to get through um, the stress. The next thing it's gonna do is it's gonna affect the muscles. And it's gonna call uh, both the cardiac and skeletal muscles. And it's going to allow for those muscle contractions to strengthen. So um, when our heart beats, every time our heart beats, it's going to squeeze and contract harder, which means it's going to push out more blood and therefore providing all of the cells in our body with more oxygen uh, and also more glucose. Uh, which is going to be in the bloodstream also. Adipose tissue. So adipose tissue is a big fancy name for fat tissue. So adipose tissue is going to be stimulated by the cortisol. It's going to stimulate lipo lipolysis, which is the breakdown of fat. Why? Well, again, if we are going to be in a very prolonged situation, we are going to need extra energy to do so. Um, you may think, well, when I'm stressed, I gain weight because you know I eat a lot. Well, if you if you maintain your eating at the same rate as always, people who um, don't you know stress eat, if they're under a long term stress, sometimes they can lose a lot of weight. Um, because, now don't stress yourself out. This is not like a weight loss program. I would not suggest it all because um, actually we'll learn that high levels of cortisol in the body for a long, for long, uh, for a long time can actually be very, very harmful to you. Um, but uh, people that are under stress um, can lose weight because um, your body's signaling for your fat to be broken down to release energy. 
Kidneys are going to be targeted. Again, they are going to be told to increase water retention, which increases blood volume, which increases blood pressure. Um, higher blood pressure is going to hopefully divert the blood uh, to areas where it, the nutrition, the oxygen is most needed. Some other effects that cortisol can have, it can enhance the activity of other hormones such as glucagon, which we're going to talk about when we talk about the pancreas. Glucagon is a hormone that raises blood glucose level. Again, the reason you would want to raise blood glucose level is because um, you want to provide that energy to each cell in the body. And it also can enhance the activity of the catecholamines, which we're going to talk about in a few minutes when we talk about the adrenal medulla. Um, the catecholamines are epinephrine and norepinephrine, and those are the um, hormones slash neurotransmitters transmitters that you think about when you get that fight or flight kind of reaction where it's you know, immediate danger and you get that kind of like shakiness like afterwards, that's your epinephrine and norepinephrine. Um, it also is going to increase blood glucose levels by being an antagonist to insulin. Insulin is um, a hormone that is produced in the pancreas that is um, designed to lower blood glucose levels. So if it inhibits insulin, it's going to be able to keep the blood glucose levels elevated, again, therefore providing more energy to each cell. And it has a somewhat anti-inflammatory effect. Um, again, this all sounds like really good stuff, but when we look at the long-term effects of cortisol in the body, uh, we start to see that it's not really a great thing to, to have. So the trigger for the release of cortisol is going to be a hormone that we talked about already that is produced in the anterior pituitary gland, the adrenocorticotropic hormone. And I think I, I said that, you know, the adrenocorticotropic hormone or ACTH has a very long name, but if you look at it and you break it down, you can kind of figure out what it does. If you see um, the adreno part, it has to do with the adrenal glands. A cortico means it is going to stimulate one of those cortico uh, um, hormones. In this case, it's the glucocorticoids. And a tropic, tropic just is a hormone that uh, stimulates the release of another hormone. So when ACTH is released by the anterior pituitary gland, it's going to stimulate the zona fasciculata portion of the adrenal cortex to release this cortisol. The adrenal cortex um, is going to, and you know what, I don't have this written in here, but I should have this written in here. Um, the adrenal cortex, oh yeah, here we go, is going to produce, I'm sorry, it is written in here properly, um, a, a hormone or a pre-hormone, shall I say, that's called dehydroepinephrine epianodrosterone, that is horrible, dehydroepiandrosterone, dehydroepiandrosterone, there we go, or DHEA, and you can actually, um, I've seen this DHEA sold as a supplement in, um, you know, health food stores, grocery stores, in the vitamin aisle, um, I guess people are taking it to up their perhaps testosterone levels or estrogen levels, I'm not really sure. Um, the, this is considered an androgen uh, hormone and it is gonna be produced in the zona reticularis or the portion that is closest to the, um, the por por portion of the adrenal cortex that is most inward or closest to the medulla. Um, in males, this dehydroepiandrosterone, uh, DHEA, um, is going to be converted into testosterone or dihydrotestosterone, DHT. In females, it is going to be converted into estrogen. Um, however, this you don't think of the adrenal cortex and it's this DHEA as being a really, shall I say, significant 
uh, contributor to testosterone and estrogen levels in males and females. Uh, most testosterone is going to come from the testes of the male and most estrogen is going to come from the ovaries of the male. Um, this is, you know, very limited. I think, um, I'm not 100% sure, but I believe that this has more function in um, like prepubescent, um, prepubescent males, prepubescent uh, females, uh, and it works some way in helping to trigger the onset of puberty, I believe. Um, but it's not the major player um, uh, for, it's not the major producer of testosterone or estrogen in uh, adults. All right, so the outer layer is called the adrenal cortex. The inner layer is called the adrenal medulla. Um, it is going to produce two hormones, or sometimes they're referred to as neurohormones, uh, because um, they, adrenal medulla is made up of ner some nervous tissue, so uh, they're referred to as neurohormones because they can act as hormones, but they also act as neurotransmitters. Both norepinephrine and epinephrine work as excitatory um, neurotransmitters um, or excitatory messages between individual neurons. So the class of hormones that these uh, adrenal that the adrenal medulla produces is a class called the catecholamines. It's just based on their structure, and the two are norepinephrine or epinephrine. And in the case of um, them being used as hormones, they often are referred to as, well, norepinephrine is referred to as noradrenaline and epinephrine is referred to as adrenaline. So you may have heard, oh, I really got my adrenaline going. Well, when you're saying adrenaline, you're essentially saying epinephrine. It's just, um, you use that term when epinephrine is you know, produced here in the adrenal medulla as a um, hormone. For our purposes, I am going to stick with calling it norepinephrine and epinephrine. Um, I really kind of hate when things in anatomy have two different names. It happens a lot, especially because uh, they like to change the names uh, periodically, but we're going to stick with norepinephrine and epinephrine instead of noradrenaline and adrenaline, but I want to mention that just so you know. So there are special cells within the adrenal medulla called the Kroffman, chromaffin cells. And the chromaffin cells are neuroendocrine cells. So they're nerve cells that are going to produce a hormone. And they secrete this adrenaline and noradrenaline or, and I just said I wasn't going to use this, but I typed it in this way, um, epinephrine and norepinephrine. And the norepinephrine and epinephrine, or these catecholamines, as they are classified, are going to be responsible for that fight or flight response, that um, self-preservation um, response we get uh, that is going to prepare our body uh, to either stand you know, our ground and fight our way out or to you know, get the heck out of there as quickly as possible. So the two catecholamines, the norepinephrine and epinephrine, um, they are gonna target and have different effects on different organs in the body. So uh, the heart is gonna be targeted. It's gonna cause an increase in heart rate. Uh, we will learn about why an increase in heart rate is going to result in an increase in blood pressure, but just trust me now, it does increase your blood pressure. Uh, again, why would we wanna do that? Because with an increase of blood pressure, you can get that blood diverted to uh, large muscles in the body so that you can, uh, you know, kick and punch your way out or you can just use your legs and run, <laughs> run away. Um, it is also going to target the blood vessels. It causes the blood vessel constriction in the skin. Uh, this is also why, you know, if you get really, really scared or, you know, you have that fight or flight, um, kind of response people often like they say oh you know he you know he, he saw the tiger running towards him and his face just went white uh, why does his face just go white well because the pinkness in his skin 
is a result of the blood flowing to the surface of the skin. Well, when epinephrine or norepinephrine get involved, those blood vessels immediately constrict so that blood is diverted away from the skin and the skin turns white. Um, it also is going to divert the blood uh, from the GI tract. So why would we want to do this? Well, when we talk about uh, blood perfusion, we talk about blood vessels, we'll talk a little bit about normally what percentage of your blood is where in your body at any point in time. Uh, we do have blood, obviously, that goes to our skin, and um, a lot of that has to do with temperature regulation because uh, heat can radiate out of the blood um, when, our, when it goes to the surface of the skin. Um, and a lot actually goes to the GI tract to absorb nutrients uh, that we have ingested. However, when we are in a, you know, pardon my language, if we're in like an oh shit situation, um, we're gonna wanna divert as much blood as possible to our muscles. And at that point in time, we really don't need to digest that, you know, those nachos that we had that can wait for a couple minutes. Um, we also, you know, can, you know, do away with um, the blood going to the skin and therefore constrict those vessels and divert the blood where it's most needed. Epinephrine and norepinephrine are also going to target the lungs. They're going to allow for uh, the bronchioles and the capillaries to dilate um, so that we can get in more air. So, so here, here's a great example. So if you have someone who um, has like a life-threatening allergy to something, um, you know, and they, or a life-threatening asthma, a lot of times they have to carry around EpiPens. Well, what is in an EpiPen? Epinephrine, that's why it's called EpiPens. And so when an individual goes into what is called anaphylactic shock, um, and their bronchioles kind of like seize up and they start wheezing and they start having trouble getting in air, you bam, give them that EpiPen, and one of the targets is gonna be the lungs, and you're gonna see an instant dilation of the bronchioles and the capillaries, allowing the airways to open up, and it can be very life saving. Uh, it's life saving. So, what is gonna trigger the adrenal medulla to release this norepinephrine and epinephrine? Well, it's gonna be inputs from the sympathetic nervous system. So the there's two parts of the nervous system. There is the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. And I always thought that this doesn't make sense to me, but the, um, the sympathetic nervous system is there to speed everything up. And the parasympathetic nervous system is there to slow everything down. Um, the reason why it doesn't make sense to me is because I think of like sympathy as you're being calming, you know, and, uh, you know, so I think sympathetic would be calming, but it's the opposite. Sympathetic is speed up. Um, they call the sympathetic nervous system the fight or flight nerve portion of the nervous system. And the parasympathetic nervous system, they call the rest and digest. So when your sympathetic nervous system you know, is, is stimulated because of some sort of danger, it's gonna send messages to those neuroendocrine cells in the adrenal medulla to start producing uh, norepinephrine and epinephrine. Okay, so I believe the pancreas is the last major gland that we're gonna talk about. So we are gonna continue on with this. Uh, and then the last lecture, we're going to just talk about some miscellaneous um, hormones that are produced in the body uh, in different various tissues. Okay, so um, the pancreas is located, um, it actually kind of wraps around the stomach. So if you look at this guy right here, his stomach would be right there. This is, his stomach would be right here. Um, this is actually the uh, start of the small intestines. And the pancreas is very um, unique in our endocrine system because it actually has both an exocrine function 
and an endocrine function. We talked about the difference between exocrines and endocrines in the very first lecture. And the exocrines gl uh, glands, remember, produced a non-hormonal substance. We talked about like sweat and saliva. Um, in this case, the non-hormonal substance is going to be a digestive enzymes. Um, exocrine glands also have a duct that is going to deliver that non-hormonal substance directly to a, a designated area. And you can see here in the pancreas, we have all of this duct system here that empties right here into the small intestines. And so there are cells within the pancreas called the pancreatic acini, or they're called acinary cells, A-I-C-I-N-A-R, um, that are going to produce uh, digestive enzymes. These digestive enzymes are going to um, move into these ducts. It's called a pancreatic duct. And the pancreatic duct is going to um, just dump those digestive enzymes directly into the small intestine so that food digestion can actually begin. Now, the pancreas also has an endocrine function, and an endocrine gland, remember, is going to produce a hormone, and a hormone is some sort of substance, we've been talking about this whole entire time, hopefully you know what a hormone is, that's going to um, attach to a specific target cell. And one of the things that we know about endocrine cells is that when they produce these hormones, they're not going to be um, pushed into or taken into some kind of duct. They're going to be released into the extracellular uh, fluid or the interstitial fluid, the extracellular um, matrix, and taken up into the bloodstream and distributed throughout the body. And so the portion of the pancreas that is going to produce the hormones are referred to as the pancreatic islets. So within the, I'm gonna move this guy over here a little bit. Within um, these acinary cells that are producing um, the individual digestive enzymes that are attached to these ducts that join together, join together, join together, and eventually um, uh, uh, make a connection with the small intestines. We have these small little clusters of cells that are referred to as the pancreatic islets. And these pancreatic islets are going to produce two different hormones, uh, glucagon and insulin, that are going to be responsible for controlling uh, blood glucose levels. Just a side note, the pancreatic islets used to be called the islets of Nangerhans. Um, Langerhans was the um, anatomist who discovered these. Um, so you may see that sometime. Langerhans is L-A-N-G-E-R-H-A-N-S. So uh, the islets of Langerhans. So um, sometimes people still refer to them as that, but um, in general, anatomy has gotten away from naming structures after people and naming them more intuitively um, based on what they do. So we will be referring to them as the pancreatic islets. Oops. So here we have actually a histological um, image of the pancreas. So these, and again, I realize that you're probably saying it just looks like purple dots, and I understand that because you are not used to looking at histology. But if you were, you know, someone who was used to looking at this, you would see that these cells here on the outside are stained much darker, and they're also clustered together more. So these would be the acini cells or the acinar cells that would produce those digestive enzymes and have that exocrine function. And then here in the middle, we have this little section that is a little bit lighter stained and the cells are as closely packed together. That's our pancreatic islet. And if we were to look at um, all of the tissue, it was here for a very long time, in a pancreas, the exocrine acinary cells would greatly outnumber the volume. The volume would greatly outnumber uh, the volume that the pancreatic islets take up. There are five different cells that are found within the pancreatic islets, and I'm not gonna make you um, figure out which ones they are. Um, I 
don't think I could actually distinguish between them um, in a, hist a histological um, picture. I can tell the difference between the islets and the Eisner cells. All right, so these are named, the five cells are named alpha, um, beta, gamma, epsilon, and the other Greek word, which I forget. Obviously, I wasn't in a sorority in, in college. Okay, so, all right, so the alpha cells within these pancreatic islets are going to be responsible for producing that hormone that is going to be involved in uh, regulating blood glucose level. And that hormone is called glucagon. Now, I apologize because at this point we have glucose, which is the um, uh, monosaccharide. It's a simple sugar. It's what our cells are going to take up and it's what uh, travels in our bloodstream. We have glucagon, which is the hormone which is going to help raise blood glucose levels. And when we were just talking about the adrenal glands, I talked about something called glycogen. And glycogen is a um, polysaccharide that is formed by individual glucose monomers joining up. And it's a way for um, animals to store um, a small amount of glucose in their liver. All right, so very similar words. Please don't blame me, I didn't name them. So glucagon is the hormone that's going to raise blood glucose levels. The next type of cell is called the beta cell. And the beta cells are going to produce a hormone that you probably have heard of before called insulin. And insulin is going to do the opposite of glucagon. It is going to be a hormone that is going to lower blood glucose levels. Uh, the beta cells also produce a protein called amylin. Um, amylin is important in slowing the gastric em emptying, or it slows the, or it elongates the time that food is in your stomach. It slows the emptying of the stomach. So this amylin actually, in a roundabout way, can lower blood glucose levels because it makes you feel full longer. And you therefore would eat less, and every time we eat food, we are going to be ingesting glucose. Delta, that's the one I forget. I'm sorry, I think there's a delta. Okay, I should remember that, okay. Delta cells um, are going to produce a hormone called somatostatin. Um, somatostatin is going to be a hormone that is going to suppress the release of other pancreatic hormones. So essentially, these delta cells are going to control or be like an internal control uh, for the hormones released from the pancreas. Gamma cells do not produce a hormone, but they produce a protein that is called pancreatic polypeptide. And it's, this is gonna be a protein that's gonna regulate both endocrine and exocrine uh, pancreatic secretion. So along with somatostatin that is produced by the delta cells, this pancreatic polypeptide is going to be an internal uh, regulator of pancreatic hormone release. And, to, oh, and pancreatic secretions too, it's going to be um, regulate the release of those digestive enzymes. And the last type of cells are the epsilon cells. And the epsilon cells produce a hormone called ghrelin. And ghrelin is a hormone that stimulates hunger. And you may, I've heard of ghrelin. Um, ghrelin is a, um, ghrelin is a very interesting hormone that has been looked at for a very long time in a way to, reduce or like as a weight loss drug like as a target for a weight loss drug um, because if people overeat because they're hungry uh, and we know that ghrelin is a hormone that will stimulate hunger if you can suppress the production of ghrelin then you would think okay well then you can suppress that hunger feeling so people should be able to eat less um, as well as um, amylin amylin is um, actually, there are um, 
weight loss drugs that target amylin, um, which allow this stomach to empty more slowly, so you have that feeling of fullness um, longer. Um, the pancreas, because it has the function of regulating blood glucose levels, which a drop in blood glucose levels can also stimulate um, hunger, um, and also because it can regulate the um, speed at which uh, food is digested, um, is often looked at for uh, production of new uh, weight loss medications. Okay, so a glucagon that is uh, secreted by the alpha cells and insulin, which is secreted by the beta cells, are going to be antagonists with each other. Remember, it's the same thing as an antagonist in a story or a movie or a play. They're going to be working against each other. So um, they're going to have opposite results. So these gluco glucagon and insulin work together to help maintain a stable blood glucose level. So when glucagon is released, it's going to result in a overall raise in blood glucose levels. So this is going to be released when we need more glucose in circulation. So think about 11 o'clock in the morning when, you know, breakfast is already, you know, gone and you're just waiting for lunch to start, your blood glucose levels start to drop, or three or four in the afternoon, your blood glucose levels start to drop. Well, this is when these alpha cells are going to kick in and start producing this glucagon to help raise your blood glucose levels to help give you a little bit more energy. And the way that it does this is it's going to promote two things. It's going to promote gluconogenesis, and we talked about what gluconogenesis was when we talked about the adrenal glands. Um, just think of genesis as the new formation, just like genesis in the Bible is the new formation of the world. So genesis is a new formation, and the gluco means glucose. So um, glucon gluconeogenesis is the synthesis of new glucose by the liver and the kidneys. In the liver, it's going to be by breaking down that glycogen into its um, glucose subunits. Um, oh no, sorry, that's going to be the glycon glyconolysis. Sorry. Um, the, all right, so gluconeogenesis is going to be the production of new glucose. And it's also going to promote glucogenolysis. And I'm sorry about the pronunciation. Um, I don't know. I'm one of those people that like, like, like memorizes like the word, but I don't really think about saying it until I have to, and then I, I wind up like butchering the word. So, glycogenolysis. So, glycogen is that long molecule stored in the liver made up of the individual uh, glucose mo molecules. Lysis means to break apart. So glyco glycogen lysis literally means to break apart glycogen. Well, if you break apart the glycogen, what are you going to do? You're going to release individual glucose subunits. So either way, you're releasing glucose into the bloodstream and the a uh, result is going to be a raise in overall blood glucose level. Uh, the trigger for the release of glucagon, again, is going to be the um, drop in blood glucose levels. Insulin has the opposite effect. Insulin is going to lower blood glucose levels. Essentially what insulin does is insulin makes it possible for glucose to exit circulation and enter into individual cells. So you kind of think of insulin is the key that unlocks the doors in the cells, which, you know, when the door opens, glucose is allowed to come in. So the way that insulin lowers blood glucose levels, besides just opening the door and letting um, the in, uh, glucose flow into the cells, it also is going to inhibit gluconeogenesis. So it's going to inhibit the kidneys and inhibit the liver from producing new glucose molecules. 
Um, it also is going to promote glycogenesis, and glycogenesis is going to be the opposite of glycogenolysis. Lysis means breaking apart, genesis means um, creating it. So glycogenesis is going to be um, the conversion of some of the circulating glucose into that glycogen, which then can be stored in the liver so that when blood glucose levels drop too low, glucagon can be released to break that glycogen apart and release the individual glucose. Sorry, that is my cell phone. Okay, so the trigger for the release of insulin is gonna be a rise in blood glucose levels. Now the reason why you may have heard of both of these hormones um, is because um, insulin secretion um, and, um, well, mostly the insulin has to do with a, or the malfunction, I should say, of um, insulin um, leads to a disorder which is very prevalent here in the South and very prevalent among uh, the American population in general now is diabetes mellitus. So diabetes mellitus is a disorder in which the body does not either produce enough insulin or it doesn't respond normally to the insulin. Um, and this causes blood glucose levels to be abnormally high. Um, glucagon is normally not involved in here. Glucagon is there, you know, raising blood glucose levels if it needs to be. But once that glucose gets into the bloodstream, uh, it has a hard time getting into the cells. So uh, blood glucose levels remain high. Um, there are two different types of diabetes. There are type 1 and type 2. Uh, the difference between type 1 and type 2 is type 1 is when your body does not produce enough, or sometimes your body not, might not produce any insulin. And this is a type one diabetes, is um, a condition that normally uh, you are diagnosed with in childhood. It is some sort of dysfunction with your pancreas. It, those uh, beta cells just do not produce enough insulin or they don't produce insulin at all. It's, n it's nothing you can do about it. And it is something that you deal with um, for the, your entire life. Um, you have to um, inject um, insulin regularly because your body just doesn't make it. Now, type 2 diabetes is different. Type 2 diabetes is often referred to as a resistant to insulin or insulin resistance. And this is, occurs when you have a sort of diet or lifestyle where you are constantly eating um, you know, high carb food and you just inundate your blood constantly with glucose. And, eventually, and, and when that glucose is in there, then your pancreas is going to release insulin. And we talked about upregulation and downregulation. And essentially this is kind of what happens because the individual cells start to become immune to the amount of insulin that your body produces. And they start to ignore the amount of insulin that your body is producing. And so insulin is there in circulation, but the cells just don't pay attention to it because it's just been overloaded with it for such a long time. And a lot of times people who have uh, type 2 diabetes will start off with oral medications that help regulate blood glucose levels. And some of them may eventually have to go to uh, injecting insulin uh, because they have to have even more insulin in circulation to do um, to actually stimulate those particular cells to take in uh, the blood glucose. And this is often referred to as late onset diabetes because this is not something that um, normally people deal with with their entire life. It's normally something um, that develops later in life as a result of um, you constantly bombarding your cells with um, high insulin levels due to um, high carbohydrate intake. All right, so we're gonna end here on this one. And when we pick up, 
it was, should be our last. So I know that's sad, right? No, not really. It was really finally done with that.